Second lecture, we will be looking at two more formulations in linear programming. We will look at a third formulation, which is the cutting stock problem. And we will be looking at another formulation, where we formulate a problem from game theory. So, let us go to the cutting stock problem. Now, in the cutting stock problem, we are talking about cutting stock of four sizes from a sheet. Now, the four sizes, we want to cut 9 inch sheets, 8 inch sheets, 7 inch and 6 inch from a 20 inch sheet. For example, we assume that we have 20 inch sheets like this. Now, from these 20 inch sheets, we want to cut sheets that have for example, 9 inch or we could have 8 inch or 7 or 6. Now, there is a requirement for each of these. So, we need, we need to go to this. Now, we need 511 sheets of 9 inch, 301 sheets of 8 inch, 263 sheets of 7 inch and 383 numbers of 6 inch sheets. You can actually assume that either we have say about 10,000 such 20 inch wide sheets with say something like a 50 inch length and you can go back and say you want 50 by 9, 511, 50 by 8, 50 by 7 and 50 by 6, we could do that. Or we could think in terms of an infinitely long roll of 20 inch width from which we want to cut 50 by 9, 50 by 8, 50 by 7 and 50 by 6. This length is actually not important to us, this width is important and we are looking at one dimensional cutting. For example, we do not allow cutting this way we allow cut only along the width. Now, the problem is to cut in such a way that we get 511 9 inch wide sheets, 301 8 inch wide sheets, 7 and 6 inch and minimize the waste. So, first thing we need to do is to define what is this waste. Now, before we go into the definition of the waste, let us see the number of ways by which Thing 2 inch will go as a waste. So, this will be a waste if we cut 2 into 9. If you cut 2 into 8, then you realize that you have a 4 inch that will go as a waste and so on. The first thing we need to do is to try and find out how many cutting patterns are possible. So, typically the first cutting pattern would be like this. You can define a pattern for example, 2 0, 0, 0 means from a 20 inch sheet, you are cutting 2 sheets of 9 inch. So, this has a waste equal to 2. Now, you could think of another pattern which could be 0, 2, 0, 0, which could have which means 2 into 8 16, which could have a waste of 4. 
Now, you could think in terms of 0, 0, 2, which means you are trying to make 7 inch cuts. So, maximum of 2 is possible with a waste of 6. And since 6 is already a requirement here, we do not treat the 6 as a waste. You could think in terms of 0, 0, 2, 1 with waste equal to 0. You could think in terms of a fourth pattern, which could be 0, 0, 0, 3 with waste equal to 2, because 6 3s are 18 and the remaining 2 inch will go as a waste. There could be more patterns. For example, we could think in terms of 1, 1, 0, 0, which would give a wastage of 3. This means, there is a 9 inch cut, there is an 8 inch cut and a wastage of 3 one could think in terms of 1 0 1 0 with wastage equal to 4. We could think in terms of 1 0 0 1 which could have wastage of 5. So, the 1 9 inch and 1 6 inch would give us 15 which would give us a wastage of 5. Now, we could go back and also think in terms of 0 1 1 0 8 plus 7 15. So, wastage equal to 5. One could think in terms of 0 1 0 2. So, this is 8 6 into 12 wastage equal to 0 and one could think in terms of 0 0 1 2. This is 7 plus 6 into 2 12 is 19 with wastage equal to 1. So, we have 3 plus 3 6 7 plus 3 10 different patterns that we have. Now, those 10 patterns are also shown on the other side on the screen. Now, one important observation in these patterns is that we have made sure that the waste is less than less than the minimum thickness that is required. We will not consider for example, we will not consider in this formulation 0, 0, 2, 0 with a waste of 6. We would rather use that remaining 6 to meet this requirement here. So, the important thing is that the wastage is less than the minimum quantity that is needed, which is shown here as 6. Now, what we want to do is, if we have many sheets like this and 10 patterns are possible. Now, we want to find out how many sheets are we going to cut with pattern 1, how many sheets with pattern 2 and so on. So, the decision variables will now become the decision variable x j is number of sheets cut using pattern j. So, x 1 to x 10 will now represent these 10 patterns and the number of sheets cut using these 10 patterns. So, now if we look at the requirement for the 9 inch, we can get 9 inch sheets if we cut using pattern number 1 we call this patterns 1, 2, 3, 4 up to 10. So, if we cut pattern 1, this pattern, this, this would give us 9 inch. So, 9 inch sheets are cut by using patterns 1, 5, 6 and 7. Similarly, 8 inch sheets are cut using patterns 2, 5, 8 and 9 and so on. So, if we decide to cut x 1 sheets using pattern 1 and so on, then as far as 9 inch sheets are concerned, we will have 2 x 1 plus x 5 plus x 6 plus x 7. Now, this many sheets we will get of 9 inch. Now, this has to be greater than or equal to the requirement of 511. The question is whether this is an equation or whether this is an inequality. Now, what can happen is sometimes not necessarily in this case, sometimes if these coefficients are not 1, it may be possible that we end up getting more than 511. 
So, it makes sense to model this as an inequality of the greater than or equal to type rather than force it as an equation. So, we put an inequality here and say the number of sheets that we get through this cut is greater than or equal to 511. Now, similarly, for the 8 inch I get 2 x 2 plus x 5 plus x 8 plus x 9 is greater than or equal to 301. For the 7 inch I get 2 x 3 plus x 6 plus x 8 plus x 10 is greater than or equal to 263 and for the 6 inch I will get x 3 plus 3 x 4 plus x 7 plus 2 x 9 plus 2 x 10 is greater than or equal to 383 the non negativity restriction is x j greater than or equal to 0. So, we have written the constraints as, as well as the non negativity restriction for this problem, which you can see is shown on the top portion of this. Now, we need to write the objective function. The objective function is to minimize the waste. So, let us write the objective function now. Now, what is a waste? When I use pattern 1, my waste is 2 inch. So, I can write 2 x 1 waste or objective function is to minimize two x one plus four x two plus zero x three, which can be left out, plus two x four plus three x five plus four x six plus five x seven plus five x eight plus zero x nine plus 1 x 10. So, we have completed this formulation. This formulation of cutting sheets is over. We required 4 different sizes of sheets 6 inch, 7 inch, 8 and 9 and we have 4 constraints corresponding to these a non negativity restriction and an objective function that minimizes the waste. The only difference between this formulation and the previous one is that the decision variables were not apparent as they were in the previous two formulations. Now, the decision variables now depend on the patterns that we are able to generate number 1. Number 2, the number of decision variables is not kind of fixed in a sense that for a different problem you could have different number of patterns possible unlike in the first two when we said that there are 4 months demand. So, you, you know that there are 4 production quantities here it does not happen that way. So, you have to do something first and then based on what you have worked out you write down the decision variable. So, the important learning in some sense here is that there could be problems where the decision variables are not very apparent. You will also realize by now that if you had addressed this problem in a different direction and if you had not thought of the possible patterns that are there and then had written the decision variable formulation would become very difficult. So, first step in any formulation is to identify the decision variable. In fact, once the decision variable is identified almost half the formulation is over rest of the constraints and objective come along with the decision variable. Now, what are the other things that we can learn from this formulation? Now, let us do something more. Let us assume for example, that if we end up making more than this 511, then we will assume that those excess sheets cut over and above the requirement also waste. Therefore, we add those excess sheets into the objective function, which we did not do earlier. Now, let us see what happens if we add the excess sheets into the objective function. To do that, let us go back and understand this. 
we are having a 20 inch sheet. Let us assume that this has this the constant length of say something like 50 is required. So, actually speaking what is the waste? The waste is not 2, but the waste is in terms of area is actually 50 into this. If we look at if we represent the waste as an area and not as a length. Now, to this we are going to add the excess as wastes. So, let us see what happens if we add the excess as waste. If we do that, then the waste here would be 9 inch 9 into 9 into 2 x 1 plus x 5 plus x 6 plus x 7 minus 511. This is the excess number of 9 inch sheets which is multiplied by 9 which is a length quantity. Here we have also multiplied by 50 to make it area. So, to be consistent we retain the length dimension we do not make it area. So, we retain it as length plus 9 into 2 x 1 this is the excess number of 9 inch sheets that have been made plus 8 into 301 sorry 8 into 2 x 2 plus x 5 plus x 8 plus x 9 minus 301 plus 7 into 2 x 3 plus x 6 plus x 8 plus x 10 minus 263 plus 6 into x 3 plus 3 x 4 plus x 7 plus 2 x 9 plus 2 x 10 minus 383. So, this is the waste. Now, we realize that something interesting will happen if we try to simplify this function. So, let us simplify this function and see what happens. Right now, we will leave this out and simplify. So, when we simplify this function, you realize that you get minimize 20 x 1 plus 20 x 2 plus 20 x 10 minus 1000 or 11146. So, this is what happens when you simplify this quite interesting that the objective function reduces to something else when you add the excess sheets into the objective function as waste and you simplify the 20 comes in because 9 into 2 18 plus 2 20 for x 1 8 into 2 16 plus 4 20 if you look at typically an x 9 or an x 10 you if you look at x 10 then you have 1 plus there is an x 10 coming here 7 plus 2 into 6 7 plus 12 19 plus 120. So, it simply becomes 20 into this. Now, what, what else can happen? Now, this constant can be taken out of the formulation. This does not depend on the variables. So, this can be removed. Similarly, this 20 is a common factor to all the terms a common multiplier with all the terms. So, 20 can also be taken out. So, your objective function now becomes minimize sigma x j. So, the problem of minimizing the waste actually reduces to the problem of minimizing the total number of cuts. If we assume that the excess material cut is also treated as a waste, then you can show that the problem the cutting stock problem to minimize waste now becomes one of minimizing the total number of cuts. Simply because the way the patterns are written. For example, if you take this pattern, this pattern has a waste of 5, this pattern has 1 8 inch, 1 7 inch and a waste of 5. So, 8 plus 7 plus 5 is 20 that is how this pattern was created. Now, when you write the excess there, it is only a constant. So, you get the same thing for every excess pattern you get an 8 plus 7 15 plus the waste 5 would make it 20. So, the important learning is the cutting stock problem reduces to 1 
of actually minimizing the number of cuts and not minimizing the waste, provided you make an assumption that the excess is also treated as a waste. Now, it is also interesting that the excess need not be a waste physical, only for the purpose of modeling you may assume that the excess is a waste. On the other hand, if, if, if you end up making more than 501, nothing prevents the person from using it again. Assuming that there is going to be a demand for the same 9 inch or 8 inch or 7 or 6 in subsequent days. We assume that this problem is some kind of a recurring problem that happens in sheet metal cutting or wood cutting or cutting uh, rectangular sheets of wood of various sizes in, in a typical manufacturing kind of an application. So, the problem is expected to repeat there is going to be daily demand for various sizes of sheets. So, if we make the assumption that this is treated as a waste then the problem becomes minimize sigma x j this can be generalized as minimize sigma x j subject to a i j x j greater than or equal to b i. If I need sheet of type i a i j is what you get from the pattern. So, sigma a i j x j less greater than or equal to b i x j greater than or equal to 0. So, it takes a very generic form where this coefficient a i j can be seen from the various patterns that you have here. Now, there is one important thing which we need to clarify at this point. We have seen three examples. The first two examples we learned the various terminology, different types of objective functions, constraints etcetera. Here we learned that the decision variables may not be apparent and certain things have to be done before the decision variables are identified. Now, we have to look at one more thing. Now, we have said that this x j is explicitly non negative. For example, I cannot have minus 5 cuts of pattern 1, it has to be a number greater than or equal to 0. Should this also be an integer? For this problem, the answer is yes, it has to be greater than 0 and integer. The same is true for the earlier formulations. You cannot make 2.5 tables, nor can you produce 107.5 items by regular time and so on. But in most of these problems, we do not explicitly state the integer for a different reason. If the problem has a linear objective function, linear constraints, non-negativity, it is a linear programming problem. All this plus the integer restriction would make it what is called an integer programming problem. So, most of the times we leave it out, because integer programming problems are solved differently compared to linear programming problems. So, we leave out the integer we try to formulate it as a linear problem and then we, we solve it as a linear programming problem and we are confident that if you still get integer solutions, it is an integer programming problem is also solved. So, even though most of these variables have to be explicit integers, we do not state them as integers when we formulate them as linear programming problems. So, we leave that out. There is one more thing we need to look at in this formulation. Can I formulate this problem in such a way that I have equations? When we started doing this, we learned that the cutting patterns may be such that I may not be able to satisfy this as an equation, I would satisfy this more as an inequality. Therefore, we wrote a greater than or equal to in this case. Suppose I consider instead of a pattern, our first pattern, if you remember, was 2, 0, 0, 0 with waste equal to 2. Can I consider a pattern which is 1 0 0 0 with waste equal to 11? Can I? So far we did not consider such patterns. We considered patterns where the waste was less than the smallest thickness that was needed. Now, can we consider a pattern like this? If we consider patterns like this, then the first thing that will happen is the number of feasible patterns or number of possible patterns will be definitely more than 10 and it will be a very long number. But if we do this, then we can go back and say if we consider an exhaustive set of patterns, we can always go back and say that it will be more than 10, you may get some 30 or 40 patterns possible, a finite number, large number. 30 or 40 possible patterns, but you will still be able to 
write it as an equation. I will be able to cut in such a way that I exactly meet the demand. You can go back and say that if for example, this is 512 against 511 and one sheet is carried, that one sheet becomes a waste in this formulation. If I write this as an equation and have an exhaustive set of formulations, then it means for that one sheet, I am using this pattern instead of this pattern. So, there is nothing wrong provided we can formulate it that way. So, if we exhaustively enumerate all patterns, there are many more. For example, you could have a 0, 1, 0, 0 with 12 and so on. In fact, you can even think of 0, 0, 0, 0 with waste equal to 20 as a pattern and yet do it. And if you do that, then you end up getting equations here in all these 4 and you will have A x equal to B. Now, this apparently is, is an inferior formulation, because it has fewer variables compared to the earlier one, but you will realize much later in, in an advanced course in operations research that the cutting stock problem is actually solved using this formulation and not the formulation with inequalities. So, if we go back and see there, this is what we try to show. If you use you get subject to A x equal to b, if you use exhaustive set of patterns and x j greater than or equal to 0. In fact, formulation with more number of variables can be used if we develop a column generation. It is too early to look at column generation now, but much later in an advanced course, we will see column generation methods and the one dimensional cutting stock problem that we have just now formulated is actually solved using a column generation and more importantly considering this equation and not inequalities and you get the equation if you look at more variables and a more exhaustive formulation such as this. So, this kind of brings us to the end of the third formulation in this course and we look at a fourth formulation before we kind of complete the formulation topic. So, we look at a fourth formulation here and that is also an interesting formulation. This is a problem from game theory. and this formulation is like this. Now, let us look at a problem from game theory, which is also formulated as a linear programming problem. Let us assume that there are two competitors, we call them A and B, who are competing for a market for the same product. You can assume any two from any industry that you know. Now, both these people A and B want to have a higher market share and both of them have some strategies with respect to promoting their product. For example, typical strategies would look like a discount you could go back and say strategy 1 would mean I give a 1 rupee discount on the product. A second strategy could be you buy 2 get a third free. A third strategy could be you get 10 percent more for the same price. A fourth strategy could be you buy this you get something else free. So, people have different strategies that they use over a period of time to promote their product. So, we assume that A and B have now thought of two strategies for each we do not know what these two strategies are. The same two are not handled by A and B. For example, A could handle a different one, B could handle another one. The information that we have here is called a payoff matrix for A, a payoff matrix for A. For example, if A plays strategy 1 and B also plays strategy 1, then A gains 3. 3 rupees or you could keep it as 3 lakhs or any amount, it A gains 3. If A plays strategy 1, B plays strategy 2, A gains minus 2 which is A loses 2. Similarly, A plays strategy 2 and B plays strategy 1, A loses 1 and for 2 and 2, A gains 4. Now, the question is this, let us assume a certain point period of time say 1 month. We will also assume that the person can instantly switch from one strategy to another. 
B can also instantly switch from one strategy to another. If you look at a situation where A is playing strategy 1 for some time. Now, what will happen is B is smart enough to understand that A is playing strategy 1. So, B will start playing strategy 2, so that A loses minus 2, A loses 2 and B gains 2. So, if A continues to play strategy 1 all the time, then B will only play strategy 2, so that B gains. Once A knows that B is playing strategy 2 to gain, A is also smart enough to switch to strategy 2, so that A gains 4. And once B knows that A is switching to 2, B will switch to 1 and this. So, this kind of a thing keeps going on and on. So, the question is given a certain amount of time, what is the proportion of times A will play this, A will play this and what is the proportion of times B will play this and B will play this, such that there is a net thing that happens. So, that is the problem we are trying to formulate in this. Now, let us look at A. This is called a payoff matrix for A exactly opposite is a payoff matrix for B. If A gains 3, B loses 3. If A loses 2, B gains 1. This is matrix for A. You can write an equivalent payoff matrix with the signs reversed as payoff for B. Now, let us look at A's problem alone. Now, A's problem will be like this. What proportion does A play strategies or options you might call them 1 and 2. So, the decision variables for A are let P 1 and P 2 be the proportion of times A plays 1 and 2. So, A is going to play this P 1 times, A is going to play this P 2 times. First and the simple thing is P 1 plus P 2 equal to 1, P 1, P 2 are defined as proportions. So, P 1 plus P 2 equal to 1. Now, A has to decide on P 1 and P 2. Now, let us assume that B, if B plays this all the time, we know that A will play this, but let us assume that if P, B plays this first strategy all the time and A continues to play these two strategies with P 1 and P 2 respectively, then A's gain will be 3 P 1 minus 2 P 2. If B plays this all the time and A continues to play this with P 1 and P 2, then A's gain will be minus 2 p 1 plus 4 p 2. We have made an assumption that A and B are equally smart. Therefore, what A will try to do is, A will try to play these in proportions p 1 and p 2, such that A would like to maximize the profit. Now, B is intelligent enough and B will play, B will not consistently play this or play this, but switch the strategies in such a way that B is going to allow A to get minimum profit, because B is an equally smart fellow. So, what A would do is, A would rather not try and maximize the profit, but A would try to play P 1 and P 2 in such a way that A maximizes the minimum profit that B is going to allow A to get. So, A would like to maximize the minimum profit that B would allow A to get. So, what will be A's problem? Now, A will have to maximize some U and B will allow U to be minimum of these two. So, B has to be the minimum of these two. So, U less than or equal to 3 p 1 minus 2 p 2 u less than or equal to minus 2 p 1 plus 4 p 2 p 1 p 2 greater than or equal to 0 and u 
we will come to that. Now, let us go back and define this again. Now, A is supposed to be following something called a maxi min strategy. A would ideally like to maximize his or her complete profit, but B will not allow A to maximize it endlessly. B will play his or her cards in such a way that A gets minimum profit and therefore, A will, will come to realistic terms and say that I would now like to maximize the minimum profit that B will allow me to get. So, A strategy is called a maxi min strategy and we, for, we formulate the problem for that strategy. So, A will try to maximize a U, which U, where U is a minimum profit that B would allow A to get. So, U has to be the minimum of these two. These are the extreme, U can be somewhere in between, U will have to be less than or equal to the minimum of these two. And then P 1 and P 2 have to be determined in such a way that U is maximized. So, this is the formulation for A's problem. Now, let us go back. Now, this formulation we have defined P 1 and P 2 as proportion of times A plays these two strategies. So, P 1 P 2 will have to be greater than or equal to 0. Now, what about this U? Now, U is the minimum profit that B would allow A to get which A tries to maximize. So, U is some kind of a profit term. Now, can the problem be in such a way that A ends up making a loss possible. Therefore, we are not sure that this U should be greater than or equal to 0. While you are sure that P 1 and P 2 are greater than or equal to 0, you are not sure whether this U is greater than or equal to 0. U could be greater than 0 if A ends up making a profit at all. U could be exactly 0 if A gets into a 0 situation and U could be negative if the maximum profit that A could get based on the minimum that B would allow A to get turns out to be negative. So, this U can be either greater than 0 or equal to 0 or less than 0. So, this U is called unrestricted in sign. U is unrestricted in sign. So, this is A's problem. So, A's problem is what is called a maxi min strategy, which you will see there. So, A tries to maximize U, you can go back and look at this. A strategy is called maxi min and would maximize the minimum of 3 P 1 minus P 2 and minus 2 P 1 plus 4 P 2 and we define U as the minimum of these two and we try to maximize U for A, you get the same problem and this U is unrestricted in sign. You can see this this is something that we are introducing for the first time. So, far we have had variables that were always greater than or equal to. Now, we look at an unrestricted in sign that can happen. So, this is because A can also end up making a loss. So, U can be positive 0 or negative depending on the situation. Now, let us go back and do something for B and see whether these two problems are actually one and the same or whether they are different. So, let us now look at the problem purely from B's point of view. Well, let us erase this and look at this. Now, what, what is B's decision? Now, B's decisions are here. So, B would like to find out with what proportion B has to play these two strategies. So, B's decision variable would be let q 1 and q 2 be the proportions proportion of times b plays the two strategies Now, obviously, q 1 plus q 2 equal to 1. Now, this, this is where you define your q 1 and q 2. Now, what, what do we do? If A consistently plays this, then B's loss will be
sorry this should read as uh, minus p 2, this should read as minus p 2. Okay. So, if, if, if b plays these two strategies with proportions q 1 and q 2 respectively, if a consistently plays this strategy, then b s loss will be 3 p 1. B's loss will be 3 q 1 minus 2 q 2. Let us go back. B plays these two strategies with proportions q 1 and q 2. So, if A plays this, then B's loss will be 3 q 1 minus 2 q 2 if A plays this strategy consistently, then B's loss will be minus q 1 plus 4 q 2. Remember both are loss to B, they are gains to A. Now, what would A and B do? Now, A is not going to play one strategy consistently. A will switch the strategies in such a way that the gain to A is maximized or the loss to B is maximized. Now, B will have to play these strategies in such a way that that loss which A wants to inflict on B is minimized. So, B will play a strategy called minimax, minimizing the maximum loss. A is going to allow B or would want B to have maximum loss and B would now play the strategies in such a way that this loss maximum loss is minimized. If A plays a maximum strategy, B would play a minimax strategy to minimize the maximum loss that A would like to inflict on B both can. What we are trying to do is we are trying to follow a very conservative strategy for both, because we want to look at this problem more as a linear programming formulation. We are not looking at it to try and solve a game theory problem. If we could have situations where both place different strategies, this, this linear programming formulation is made under the assumption that A would play a maximum and B would play a minimax. If they play different strategies, we would get different formulations. That is it. So, now what we want to do is we want to minimize a v minimize v. Now, v is the maximum loss that a would inflict on b. Now, these are the two extreme scenario for the losses. So, v should be greater than or equal to 3 q 1 minus 2 q 2 and v should be greater than or equal to minus q 1 plus 4 q 2, q 1 q 2 greater than or equal to 0 and v again can be unrestricted, because we do not know. If for example, A makes net profit, then B would make net loss. If A makes net loss, B would make net profit. So, we do not know. So, v is also unrestricted in sign. Now, this is B's problem and this is A's problem. We will have to quickly come back to A s problem to make the small correction, which we did. A s problem would mean that A plays this with P 1 and P 2. So, when B plays this strategy consistently, A s gain will be 3 P 1 minus P 2. If B plays this, it will be minus 2 P 1 plus 4 P 2. Therefore, this correction comes. Now, we look at these two problems and immediately we get a feeling that these two problems are related because for the same data we have looked at A's problem and B's problem. Somewhere we also know we, we will have a gut feeling that when A solves the problem and gets this u which is the, the, the profit that A makes, it is very likely that that will be the same v that B loses. So, both these problems are actually related and in fact, it is enough to formulate only one. If we formulate A's problem and solve it and we get this u we know that that will be equal to that v which is the b's problem and then from then 
the q 1s and the q 2s can also be determined. So, what, what have we learnt in this formulation? We have actually learnt two things. One is the first simple learning is you could have variables that are unrestricted in sign. So, this brings us to a summary with the objective function can be of two types maximization and minimization. In the first three examples, we saw one maximization and two minimization problems. In this example, we saw both maximization and minimization that are here. Your constraints can be of three types a less than or equal to, a greater than or equal to and an equation. We have seen all three types of constraints in all the problems that we have seen. So far, the decision variables were of the greater than or equal to type in all the three formulations. And in this formulation, we have introduced something called an unrestricted variable. We could also have variables that are less than or equal to. So, you could have three types of variables, three types of constraints, two types of objective functions and we have seen all this. What we have also seen in this formulation are two things. If we look at this very carefully, we wrote down two expressions 3 p 1 minus p 2 and minus 2 p 1 plus 4 p 2 and said the objective is actually a maxi min strategy, which means we want to maximize the minimum of certain functions and that we wrote as we introduced another variable u, we said maximize u subject to minimum of something. In this we said the objective is to minimax the loss. So, we defined another variable v which was not originally in the problem and then we represented the objective of minimax by minimizing v and v greater than or equal to this. In some sense we learnt how to formulate situations when we want to maximize the minimum value of certain expressions or to minimize the maximum value taken by certain expressions. So, that is another thing that we have learnt in this formulation. The last thing that we learnt which is the most important thing very peculiar to this formulation is the formulations it actually has two formulations one for a one for b which we independently did we had a formulation for a which is this we had a formulation for b which is this which we independently did and then we realized that for this problem the two players a and b are explicit apparent so we looked at two problems and we said somewhere that these two problems look similar and it's actually enough to formulate one we end up formulating the other in reality what happens is we will go we will show later that every linear programming problem also has an associated linear programming problem which was very evident in this example not so in the earlier three and then we will go back and say that every linear programming problem has an associated problem and if you solve one you could go back and solve the other indirectly. So, that is something which we will see later in this course. So, let us go back to this slide and see the summary. Now, we go back to B's problem which is minimize V, V is greater than or equal to 3 q 1 minus q 2 and so on. Since A's gain is B's loss and vice versa, we know that the optimum A's problem and B's problem will have the same value as the objective function that we saw. It is not necessary to solve both, it is enough to solve only one we could get from the other. In fact, later when we do something called duality theory, we will see that B's problem is actually the dual of A's problem and vice versa which also we will show that every problem has an associated problem and by solving one we can actually solve the other. Yeah. Now, we have seen four linear programming formulations, we have seen uh, different types of objective functions, constraints and learned few things. What are the assumptions? There are some assumptions that we have made while we have formulated all this. First one is called linearity, objective function and constraints are linear, only then it is a linear programming problem profit from A and B is the sum of the individual profits. When we use a 6 x 1 plus 5 x 2, we said the total profit is actually the sum of the individual profits. The proportionality profit of one item is A, two items it is 2 A. So, we said if each item he makes 5, for two items he would make 10 and so on. Simple divisibility and multiplicity same as proportionality, divisibility also ensures that it is proportionally divided. Most important we have deterministic assumptions all parameters and coefficients are deterministic, they are known with certainty right at the beginning and they do not change during or after the formulation. 
we are not looking at at any probabilistic situation where we define a profit function which is a distribution. Here we assume that all coefficients and parameters are deterministic. The next one, right. So, in the end of the formulation in these two lecture sessions that we have, we have seen four examples. One can go on and on and create different situations for formulation endlessly. In fact, with every formulation you, you can actually learn something new. What we have tried to do is using four examples, we have tried to show to you the various aspects of problem formulation, the terminology, the definition in terms of objective function constraints and variables, different types of objective functions constraints and variables, different situations where in some situations the formulation will be explicit, the variables will be obvious and in some other where something else have to be done to get to the variables. And lastly, a problem wherein we define both two problems and we just say that one solving one is enough and we can get the solution to the other. So, with this we end the linear programming formulation of this course, we will do the linear programming solution in the next class.